Let me begin with prayer and then we'll uh, go ahead into the study. Join me as I pray. Loving, gracious Father, as always, uh, we're so grateful to you that uh, through the various uh, issues and situations of life, you give us this opportunity to come together on this platform. So wonderful to see my brothers and sisters uh, as we continue to engage in uh, Bible studies and discussions. There's so much we learn and there is yet so much to learn. Why don't you please help us, Lord, as we open our minds and hearts to you and uh, help us to see what we need to see uh, help me as I uh, lead through this study. And obviously, I pray for uh, your help that uh, the inspiration will remain uh, for us to be able to see Scripture, hopefully in a fresh light, in a new light, because there is uh, so much more packed in Scripture. So I commit the study into your hands and ask your blessings upon all our hearing and our listening in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Okay, uh, the uh, title that, as I had posted on our group, is How Human Marriage or Family Images the Trinitarian Nature of God. And uh, uh, I had done a study on this some time back. Recently, I was involved in a, in a counts marriage counseling. And for some reason, I had to revisit this particular topic. Uh, and uh, I thought, since it's fresh in my mind, I should bring some, uh, some of these thoughts uh, in the Bible study today. Uh, uh, just to mention that uh, both Sachin and uh, Praveen are continuing to be a little busy. So I hope you have not got tired of hearing my voice. Uh, uh, Franklin continues to make himself available to help, but uh, thank you, Franklin. But I continue to tweak his topics so that <laughs> it'll it'll be a little bit more challenging. So I'm waiting for a challenging topic that he'll bring up. Okay, today actually my study is on Genesis chapter two and verse twenty four. Uh, I'm going to take that one verse and try to uh, see a little bit more deeply into it uh, because I, I believe that there is a lot of meaning packed into that. So uh, 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 the uh, uh, I want to analyze what Genesis 2.24 says and then move towards how the Trinity is reflecting so much of what is in Genesis 2.24 and obviously uh, the connection to marriage becomes very clear. Let me bring up the scripture and I'll do, I mean, I'll bring up uh, the context also and then we will get into the study. So uh, let me just uh, uh, get to the screen. I think you can see the screen right now. Uh, and so uh, here is the is Genesis chapter 2, and I think it begins somewhere in 20, uh, uh, 20. All right, I'm going to read off the screen so you can follow with me. Uh, and I'm sure you remember where we are picking up the story. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. Verse 21, so the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and then closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man and he brought her to the man. The man said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman for she was taken out of man. And verse 24 is the crucial one. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and is un united to his wife and they become one flesh. And it completes uh, verse uh, chapter 22, uh, uh, completes in verse 25. Adam and his wife were both naked uh, uh, and they were not ashamed. I think I missed out that. So that is the uh, uh, context. And verse 24, once again, is what we will focus on where it says, 
That is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife and they become one flesh. Okay, I'm going to stop the share there and then just pick up that verse part by part. If you notice, some there is three aspects in that verse. There is a leaving aspect and there is a uniting aspect and then there is a oneness aspect. So some, some people would like to call it leaving, weaving, and becoming. <laughs> so that is the uh, uh, what we are going to engage in. Okay, notice it says in verse 24, uh, that is why a man leaves his father and mother. Right, so let's just focus on that. Now, Adam had no physical mother and father, right? So why is uh, the scripture saying, leaving father and mother. Adam was created by God and God was more or less his father and there was no mother. But obviously, the it is included there uh, and it is meant for teaching an important aspect of the institution of marriage. We all believe that is where the institution of marriage uh, came into being. And the institution of marriage is from God. It is not a human creation. It is not of human ordination. The institution of marriage is the, uh, the God is the originator for it. All right. So the leaving of father and mother. Obviously, one would wonder why would God say leave your father and mother? And some would be a little offended and say, well, are we supposed to abandon mother and father? The scripture very clearly says we are to honor our mother and father, right? Uh, and honor the elders. So obviously, the uh, I feel there is a much deeper meaning when it says leave your father and mother. My understanding of this aspect is that what the verse is indicating is, is that all the while, either a son or a daughter, the children were always turned towards the parents. They were with the parents. You could use the word, they were turned towards the parents. But when they marry, uh, this institution of marriage intends, now they turn towards the spouse. It is a turning away from uh, parents where they grew up and now turn towards the spouse. In other words, the spouse now takes priority. You see, most of life is now lived with the spouse. And so the leaving father and mother is, uh, God is helping us to recognize and understand that you were always turned towards your father and mother. But now that you're married, you turn towards your spouse. It is the spouse towards whom the commitment is, the the priority is, the prior commitment is, the spouse now has to be engaged in all matters of daily living, right? While retaining your love and honor for your parents. So it is not an abandonment. It is where your priority lies. And I'd like to use these words. You turn away, you not turn away in the sense of abandonment, but turn towards your spouse. <clears throat> While I say that, this is now the instruction to the uh, to the man, and obviously it includes the wife. Uh, the wife also must turn towards the spouse. And I would like to add an, uh, an, uh, an important aspect here. The parents must and will should need to understand that now the the married child is going to turn towards the spouse. They must be willing to release the child. You see? Uh, and not become an impediment and hold on to the child by manipulation or through whatever. So many in-law problems is because this is violated. Either the child does not turn towards the spouse or the parents do not release the child. So this is an important aspect that we need to keep in mind. All right. Uh, that is what 
I would like for us to understand this turning towards the spouse. Okay, we'll come back to that. Let's go to the second part. Notice it says, leave father and mother and be united to your wife. You be united to your spouse. The uh, Hebrew word there, and I think the King James picks it up, where it says, leave your father and mother and be joined to your wife. All right? Or united to your wife. You know, cleave to your wife. These words are indicative of or suggests that there is an intentional movement towards the other, towards your spouse. And why is there a movement towards your spouse? For the sake of joining, for the sake of uniting, for the sake of now uh, engaging with the spouse. Right? Now, why would, what, why would God want the, both the spouse to do that once they turn towards each other? Now the, there should be a movement towards each other. It's not just turning and staying where you are, but now you move towards each other, right? I'd like to, you know, understand this from the perspective of that God wants to bring a completeness. We remember uh, God had told Adam that it was not good for him to be alone. He needed a helper. He needed someone to compliment him. And so when he is instructing them that as you turn, turn toward each other, now start walking towards each other, you know, move towards each other. Why? Because that completes male and female coming together, completes, I could say, the image of God. Both are made in the image of God. But then there is a sense of completeness, you know, uh, both achieve when they are moving towards each other. I'd like to say this is an act of love. And love is an action. Love is not just merely a feeling or an emotion. You manifest love through various ways of intimacy. right? So here, through this uh, portion of scripture, God is helping us to understand that both spouses now are engaged in a movement towards each other a dynamic reality of engaging one another in the act of living, of act of living life. Uh, it is both spouses are showing a desire for one another and manifesting that desire to engage the other. It's a deliberate attempt to indwell and bring about a unity. Right? Of course, that is the next part. But unless you move towards each other, there is no unitedness or there is no unity achieved, right? So in the institution of marriage, as you turn towards each other and you move towards each other, you are doing life together. So what is this moving towards each other? You're, you're living life together. You're not remaining alone. You're not remaining isolated, right? In other words, all the faculties of life is being engaged as you move towards each other. Uh, now, I, I mentioned this a little earlier. I'll say it again. Both being in the image of God and they move towards each other, male and female, the image of God. They What they do is they compound the reality, the intensity of that image. Right? They more perfectly image God when they come together. All right? Now, Hold that thought and let's move to that third aspect of the scripture. What does it say? Leave father and mother, be joined to your wife, and they become one flesh. They become <clears throat> one flesh. The word uh, 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 one is the Hebrew word ekad, ekad, or however you pronounce it, right? Uh, God's unity, actually in Deuteronomy chapter 6, if you remember the Shema, God is one. The word Eckhart is used for God. God's unity is described as Eckhart. And the concept of the unity in marriage 
is also described as a card. You become one flesh, a card, one a card, right? So the goal of turning towards each other and moving towards each other, joining, is to give rise to a oneness, a union. Though they remain two individuals, the process of engaging and joining is to bring about a oneness which is in which is an inseparable. It's an inseparableness. And that is why all of you will know that we in the in the you know our, our understanding of the Christian institution of marriage is still death do us part. It should be inseparable. Jesus confirms this. If you remember what he was telling uh, some of the religious teachers, he said, what God has joined together, let not man separate. So God was, I mean to say, this is all in the context of marriage. What God has joined together, let not man separate. So God sees a oneness which he blesses and he does not intend for that to be broken, uh, you know, apart. Because this movement towards each other and turning towards each other brings about a oneness that is so complete that uh, only physical death can lose those bonds. That's why it says, uh, till death do us part. So this eka oneness, helps them experience an ecstasy of perfection in the physical the emotional, the relational, and the spiritual dimensions of life. In other words, this oneness is a fullness of unity. Right now, I, 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 I you know, many of them say, "Well, this is talking about the sexual union." Yes, it is, but it is much more than the sexual union. Obviously, that is a physical intimacy, but that gives rise to an intimacy that goes beyond the physical. And so this is the institution of marriage as described in Genesis 2 and verse 24. All right, so I have uh, uh, expounded Genesis 2 verse 24, and I hope that you are able to catch that God intended much more than just physicality in the marriage institution. He wants man, male and female, to turn to each other. When they are turning to each other, they're turning away from their parents, leaving father and mother. And then they are joining or moving towards the spouse. So there is a dynamic expression of love and it could include the sexual union. And then it results or gives rise to a oneness which God believes is inseparable. All right. Hold those thoughts, okay? Keep all of those thoughts in your mind. Let's go to the Trinity. What does the Bible reveal about the Trinity? I'm going to read in John 1, verse 1, and I'm sure you'll remember the verse, and maybe I'll just bring it up on the screen. John 1 and verse 1. Let, give me just a moment. All right. Uh, right, let me just uh, okay. let me just go down to the scripture, okay okay, John one and verse one, here is the verse in the beginning uh was the word. And the word was with God, and the word was God. Verse 2 says he was with God in the beginning. All right. So, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God. You know, the original Hebrew, or sorry, the Greek, uh, the New Testament written in Greek, seemed to indicate the, or gives the intention that when it says the word was with God, it actually means the word was turned toward God. 
the word was turned toward God. In other words, they had a face-to-face -face relationship. Father, Son, in the Holy Spirit had a face-to-face -face relationship. The sense that we get here is a positive, intimate desire towards the other. Like I said, it's a face-to-face -face relationship. What it, what it means is, the word was with God. It means is there is absolutely no discord between Father, Son, of course, in the Holy Spirit. It is such that the face is turned towards them. It is not turned away. When you, when you, when you have discord, what happens? You turn away from the other. Isn't it? You turn yourself away from the other. But here the intention is the word was with God. The, the son and the father were turned toward each other. Right? It once again gives the intention or the, the meaning that there was no animosity, but total dedication toward the other. Now let me bring the marriage analogy. In the marriage analogy, that was what it was intended. That Husband and wife, male and female, turn toward each other. Just as the father turns towards the son. The son is turned toward the father. What does it mean? Uh, no discord. You know, uh, a, 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 a relational harmony. And so in the Trinity, father and son are turned toward each other. Face-to-face -face relationship. Right? Keep that in mind. Let's move now. Uh, John 17. Let me just bring those verses uh, again on the screen. All right. In John 17, I'm going to the second aspect of uh, Genesis 2.24. Uh, in, in John 17... In, in verse 13, notice what it says. I am coming to you. Now, I'm, I'm breaking into a thought there. Jesus is now praying to the Father. And this is Jesus' long prayer. And notice what he says. I'm picking it up in verse 13. I'm coming to you now. But I say these things while I'm still in the world. Dropping down to verse 20. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. That all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. Uh, you know, un try to understand the metaphor there. Father is in me, I am in you. I'd also like to read Matthew 11 verse 27. It's on the screen. In verse 27 it says, All things have been committed to me by my Father. No one knows the Son except the Father. No one knows the Father except the Son. And to those, to those to whom the Son chooses to reveal Him. Now, I've read those verses. And let me just bring some thoughts of mine to those verses. All right? Notice it says in John 17, Jesus as he prays, I am coming to you. Do you see a movement? Jesus is moving towards the Father. I am coming to you. All of these indicates an action, the action of moving towards each other, to be joined with the Father, right? Uh, the Son's desire is to be with the Father. And so he says, I am now coming to you. Okay? John 17 verse 20 says, the Father is in me and I am in the Father. Father in me. In other words, Father has moved towards the Son to take in dwelling in the Son. I am in you. The Son is moving towards the Father and taking his dwelling in the Father. Right? So there is a movement. Father and Son move towards each other. You remember Matthew 11. What does it say? No one knows the Son except the Father. And no one knows the Father except the Son. Once again, if you go to the original Greek, there is a slight nuance to that. And I'd like that. And this I learned from a theologian, an Indian theologian. His name is L.T. Jayachandran. 
And he brought this uh, perspective to me. Uh, and I thought it was just wonderful to, to read that. When it says, no one knows the father, what the Greek intends to show is, no one keeps knowing the father. No one keeps knowing the father. And no one, I mean to say, uh, uh, sorry, uh, the, the son keeps knowing the father and the father keeps knowing the son. It, it's not just no one knows the father. It is uh, uh, the son keeps knowing the father. <laughs> I hope I'm not confusing you. The son keeps knowing the father. The father keeps knowing the son. It's not just the father knows the son. It is the father keeps knowing the son. It's not just the son knows the father. The son keeps knowing the father. What it intends to tell us is that there is a dynamic relationship of knowing that is going on. The knowing does not end. The father doesn't know the son and ends there. No, there is a dynamic knowing that is continuous. It's a continuum. The knowing is continuous. It's a continuous flow of knowing and being known. Knowing and being known. It is a powerful, dynamic, relational, you know, reality that we see there. Let me come to marriage. Be joined to your wife. Move towards your spouse. What does it intend? An intention of keep knowing your spouse. Right? Keep moving towards because you will know the spouse even more and more and more. And even after 37 years of my marriage, I am still knowing my, my wife. There are still surprises that you can discover. And can you imagine the father and son enjoy knowing each other because it is a freshness of knowing, continuously knowing. Right? That is the relational dynamic that exists in the Trinity, which... God wants us to realize in our, in our, uh, you know, uh, the institution of marriage. All right. The father and son are turned toward each other, showing perfect unity and one, I mean, it is perfect harmony. Then there is a continuous knowing. Let's go to the third part. And I'll bring up John 17 again. Uh, here in John 17. Uh, let's see, I'm going to John 17, verse 20. Notice it says, my, my prayer, this is Jesus continuing his prayer to the Father. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. Notice verse 21, and look at those, uh, 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 the ones in red. That all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. I in them and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you loved me. I hope you noticed those uh, highlighted ones in red. <clears throat> You see, in verse 21, it talks about that all of them may be one father, just as you are in me and I am in you. The father and son moves towards each other. First, they are turned towards each other. Then they move towards each other in the knowing <coughs> continuum. And they, it gives rise to a oneness. It gives rise to a, a special kind of unity. In verse 22, it says uh, that they may be one as we are one, as we are one, the oneness of God. And then in verse 23, it says that they may be brought to complete unity, complete unity, a unique oneness, which is a unity in diversity. So 
turn toward each other and move towards each other in a continuous knowing which gives rise to a unity which is complete in every dimension, a oneness. That is the dynamic in the Trinity. In marriage, they become one flesh. Right? They become one flesh. They are turned towards each other, more, leave father and mother. They are turned towards each other, just as the son and the father are turned toward each other. Right? The son was, the word was with God. That means they are turned towards each other. They are, and, and in and marriage it says, be joined to each other or be united to each other, a continuous uniting paradigm, just as the father is constantly knowing the son and the son is constantly knowing the father. In marriage, then they become one flesh. They attain a oneness that is a fullness of unity. The Trinity is all of the above. Father, Son, Spirit turn toward each other, constantly moving towards each other, enjoying the bliss of complete unity. They are one God, though they are Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Do you see the parallels? <laughs> Do you see the uh, the dynamic in the Trinity? And then do you see how God invested that same unity in the institution of marriage? Okay. That is what I wanted you to see. How marriage and family reflects the nature of the Trinitarian Union. Right. I'll end with just two reflections. I just now that that's the theology that I just <laughs> gave you. Just two reflections. God wants us to, to experience the dynamic that he experiences between Father, Son, Holy Spirit. He wants humanity to experience that. He started with the institution of marriage. That's a communion. But then he wants that to move in the move towards a family. He wants that to move towards you know, a community, a nation. An entire world. So God has invested a, uh, you know, a dynamic where we are all united as the family of God. But look at the confusion today, you know, with regards to gender and the marital confusion. People are not even knowing, or some uh, it's coming to a point where they don't know whether they're male or female. There's a confusion. And then the marriage institution is now, now they are saying it's no more between male and female. Uh, they want to expand that. And what happens is when we are getting into this confusion, this distorts the image of God. The same image that was invested in us. When we distort the image of God, we don't know who God is. And when we don't know who God is, we descend into more and more confusion. We corrupt the nature of God and then we are left with our own hellish relationships which we see around. Okay? So that is one reflection I'd like to bring that when we don't know who God is and that's one of the questions we constantly ask in GCI, who is this God that we worship? And if we are confused about the God we worship, everything is confusing for us. Beginning with the institution of marriage, and then moving on to the community. And that's the second part. When our marriages are completely confused, then community becomes confused. And you can see that today in the world. Racism, casteism, division, you know, uh, discrimination. Why? Because we don't know who God is who created us, created us with a desire to be turned towards each other rather than turning away from each other. We are supposed to be walking towards each other, but we are all walking away from each other. We are supposed to enjoy a complete unity, but there is complete disunity. And we can see in our parliaments and in our Senate how that happens and takes place. All right. 
So God's intention for humankind was to image him, to be his images. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, human, in, in the human institution of marriage, male, female, husband and wife, in community as brothers and sisters, in a nation as states together. But that unity has been completely destroyed and distorted because we are beginning to distort the very image of God. I think I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Uh, let me request you now then to make any comments. Did it make sense? Uh, is there anything that you would like to add? Yes, sir. Anil, go ahead. Well, you started with the Trinitarian unity and perspective, but uh, where does the Holy Spirit fit into this? We mentioned the Son, the Father, one. Yeah. <laughs> Isn't the Holy Spirit fitting into all this? Uh, yeah, you see that <laughs> the Father and Son is mentioned, but when the Father and Son is mentioned, the Holy Spirit is not far behind. Right Now, I, I didn't go into a full-blown Trinitarian explanation. Uh, I'm just taking the Father and Son, but the Holy Spirit is very much there. The Father, the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father, you know, uh, or proceeds from the Son in the Father. So uh, I have not explained the triunity of Father, Son, Holy Spirit. What I'm trying, what I was trying to explain was the relational dynamic, which is ref should be reflected in the institution of marriage. Now, if you want to, where Father, where the Holy Spirit fits in, then we'll have to discuss the entire Trinitarian perspective, which if you want, we can do one of these days. Yeah, that'll be nice. <clears throat> right. uh, thank you, Franklin, for uh, putting in a plug for the Bible study today. Uh, you mentioned about an important doctrine, and uh, this is indeed, uh, from a GCI perspective, we believe this is the core, one of the core doctrines. Uh, and uh, like I said, if we don't know who God is, then we uh, we are going to be corrupted and we will be in confusion. Anything you would like to comment on that, Franklin, in terms of the the core coreness of the doctrine? Sir, sir, can you hear me, sir? Yes, go ahead. Uh, sir, I'm on Wi-Fi, sir. I'm on Wi-Fi on mobile. Okay. Uh, sir, uh, I mean, excellent point, sir. It is a core doctrine. All relationship is based on it. Uh, so now, taking the, uh, the, the thought, little more ex extrapolating the thought, sir. Science is not possible, sir. If you don't understand the triunity of God, you cannot, we cannot do science, sir. Just as human relation, sorry, just as human relationships, no, sir, uh, uh, take, a, uh, I mean, suffer, and then they they are they are slowly but dooming uh, to uh, destruction when there is no when you don't understand the triunity of God. Similarly, sir, we cannot do science, sir, if you don't understand the triune God, Father, Son, and the Spirit. Sir, uh, uh, to to recall what you taught us, sir, several decades ago. Uh, love is a relational word, sir. The supreme act of creating man, the supreme act of creating the universe is uh, God is sharing his love. And uh, love is, love, as you beautifully put it, sir, love does not exist in a standalone mode. Uh, we need at least minimal two people. And we have Father, Son, and the Spirit. Uh, similarly, sir, uh, God in his love created the universe. Uh, God's love for humanity uh, predates creation. Even before the foundations of the world were, were laid, uh, uh, God had you and me in his mind and he created. And uh, uh, fast forward into the when the whole universe will come um, to a close, we are heading towards a glorious future. Sir. When the laws of physics will be uh, abolished and there will be peace, unity, joy, and untold uh, uh, enjoyments. <laughs> yeah. Well, Franklin, what do you mean by even science is not ex explainable without this uh, the Trinity? Uh, Franklin, Franklin uh, Anil is asking, 
about uh, yes, your sir. comment with regards yes. to science. Uh, sir, uh, sir, I am uh, yes, sir, sure, sir. Uh, but so, excuse me, sir. Please repeat, sir. No, please I repeat. Am asking, you had mentioned that even science is not possible without this perspective of, you know, the triunity and so on. So what did you mean by that? So can you say, can you repeat, sir? See, in, in your message, or even now you just mentioned that without yes. this, not, not, without this, not only relationships, even science is not possible. Yes. Sir. So what do you I'm, mean I'm, by that? Sir. Yes, sir. Sir, uh, uh, sir, maybe I'm I'm yet to study the subject, sir. But I'll I can do a full a full I can do a full uh, presentation on that. Sir. Yeah, but in, yes, a, in a sentence, in a nutshell, can you explain why is science not possible without this relationship? <laughs> yes, sir. It's a good question, sir. But uh, sir, uh, so the universe, sir, uh, as we understand, sir, as Christianity understands. Uh, time is uh, uni uh, Christianity teaches sir. Time is uh, unidirectional. It is irreversible. It is unstoppable. It begins at a particular point of time and it moves forward. So the time is coming, sir, when the whole universe uh, will come to an abrupt, will come to an end, and we will move into what we call in the GCI as a as a glorious world tomorrow. I think uh, I think what Franklin means is I, I I'm not very uh, sure uh, if this is what he means. This whole what he probably is trying to say is that uh, reality is relational in nature, and it's only when we understand that relationality science is possible. Science is one. Uh, one entity in relationship to another entity, right? And so I'm presuming that Franklin is saying that unless we understand that relationality, which is the very fundamental aspect of reality, uh, we we probably uh, won't be able to proceed in in you know with science. I mean, I, I'm not sure if I'm right on that, Franklin, but uh, I'm just offering sir, an explanation. Uh, uh, sir, uh, I'm still yet to do. A, I'll do a full length presentation. But okay. meanwhile, sir, I mean, what I want, want, I would like everyone to understand is uh, God not only had a physical purpose in creating you and me, not God did not have a mere physical purpose in bringing the universe into existence. He has much more than that. He has a spiritual purpose where we will spend eternity with our heavenly in the triune fellowship of the Father, Son and the Spirit. Okay. Well, if we can go back to uh, what we uh, discussed today, uh, is there any other, uh, you know, comments you'd like to offer that when we are unable to see the dynamic of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, how it um, corrupts uh, human interactions? Uh, anything, anybody would like to just expand on that or offer any other comment on that? Uh, maybe I would like to <laughs> share my learnings uh, from this perspective. Go ahead, as we, talk, as we talk about triune God and if we have to contextualize to our generation, we see that uh, Father, Son and the Spirit are equal. And we also see in Genesis that he made men and women in the same image, in his image. So I think that's where uh, uh, this current generation is facing problem that like I am superior over one another. So if we can uh, think from triune perspective, so everyone is equal in God's image. And we also see that uh, submission in spite of all that equality, the Father, Son, and the Spirit, Jesus, as a Son of Father, He submits to the Father. So we can learn that submission uh, as a reflection from the Father in the family life so that we can have that uh, a happy family inside of us. Okay. 
Thank you, Manoa. You mentioned about equality and submission, right? If I, if I get you right. Yeah. Uh, uh, yes, I think, uh, I think it is in the triunity of God we understand and know that everyone is to be respected. But in our world, there's discrimination. And I think uh, that's very unfortunate. People, one, one consider them better than the other, more superior than the other. And that is not uh, uh, something that we learn from the Trinity. There is a oneness and they, there is, the oneness happens only because there is a equality. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. Yes, Rekha, go ahead. When we compete with each other rather than complete each other, the problem arises. For instance, uh, greed or power or whatever, there are so many issues that come in. We don't try to complete each other for in yeah. unity rather than just competition. Very true, very true. I mean, uh, completing and competing <laughs> are, <laughs> are two different things. Yes, uh, uh, there is so much of competition unnecessarily oh, yeah. and, uh, mm -hmm. uh, and that causes uh, a great deal of upheaval. Yes, very true. And uh, for us to complement one another, we must respect one another. So uh, respect that the other person is equally important as I am. But uh, unfortunately, uh, that is so far in between <laughs> human beings. Very good. Well, today I thought I'll give you some, some core theology. <laughs> uh, and of course, this is something that is uh, very... Um, uh, what do you say, close to our heart in GCI, uh, we uh, constantly bring the aspect of who God is and how it uh, reflects in so many aspects of human living. And it reflects in human, the institution of marriage so powerfully that if husbands and wife understand that uh, hopefully, it will give them a good foundation to uh, build their marriage on, that they turn toward each other. Just doing that will, will reduce in-law problems. <laughs> and then they, when they walk towards each other, when they are deliberately take the attempt to be joined together, physically, emotionally, spiritually, relationally, in so many different ways, they do life together. Rather than competing, like you said, uh, Rekha, life can be so much more beautiful. And when those two things are realized, there is a oneness which we can enjoy. Any last words from anyone? I think that oneness extends to the, to the sons and daughters as well, the children as well. Otherwise, you know, there is still this unity if the Husband, wife get along, or the children and parents don't mm -hmm. get along. There's a huge right. problem. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, father, mother, children. You know, right there, there's a threeness. <laughs> and of course, uh, when you look at your children, they are reflecting father and mother. And if father and mother are not turned toward each other and uniting, the children are then uh, going to be. Uh, left in the lurch, right? They don't learn unity. So yes, so much, so much we can learn from the Trinitarian reality with regards to marriage and how our marriages can be so much more successful if we look at the Trinitarian reality. That is what I wanted to bring. I wanted us to understand the theology of Father, Son, Holy Spirit and in their, and in their relationship, how that translates into uh, human uh, marriage and family. If there are no other comments, uh, I want to thank you all for joining. Yes, uh, Surimurti, go ahead. Please unmute and uh, give your comment. In, in India, uh, the boy gets married to the wife but still, he is turned only towards his parents. <laughs> but that situation 
uh, keeps a very stable family. I mean, that is my feeling. Uh, Surumit, did you say that uh, the parents are turned only towards the son? Is that what you said? No, no. After the marriage, yeah, the boy, the boy's head is only the parents. He <laughs> has to take the dictation only from the parents. Oh, from parents. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, he, he, he has to take care of the parents. They again have to get, uh, take care of him. So that situation, uh, I think, is a uh, uh, a good, uh, stable family. Okay. Okay. Uh, you're talking about a harmony there. Yes, yeah, harmony and stability. See, if a person, if a boy gets married and gets away, ignoring the parents, that leads to unstable family. Yeah. Uh, that's an important point I, I wanted to mention. When, it, when, the, when Genesis 2 says, leaving father and mother, it does not, I mean, in my understanding, it is not uh, physic, a, a physical leaving. It is, like I said, you're turned towards them, but now you turn towards your spouse, right? So that is what I understand from that, the larger meaning. Uh, so, like I said, you uh, it's not a, uh, you know, something to say that you're, you should abandon your parents, no. And of course, you, you brought up the Indian situation where the parents are, you know, normally with uh, the sons. But that is changing, isn't it? I mean, lots of, uh, we hear are lots of issues where that uh, scenario is changing. Good, thank you very much. Uh, any other thoughts or comments? But uh, I hope you were able to catch the connection, Trinitarian and, and the institution of marriage and how God is the originator of the institution of marriage and what he intended for that institution. Okay. So thank you very much for joining. I guess we can, uh, more or less our time is gone. And if I can request, uh, uh, Rekha, would you like to offer a prayer today and close us off? Thank you. Yes, bow our heads. Eternal Father, Almighty God, we come before your royal throne with a humble and grateful heart. Thanking you, Father, for assuring us so much, Father. We really are a mighty and awesome God, and we really have a lot to learn. Today, we learn so much about marriage, oh God, and kids and all the family, Father, which we did not understand before. Thank you, Father, for opening our minds to so many good things. We are very, very grateful for everything. Please, Father, help us to learn and stay in unity as you are in unity with, with, with Jesus Christ, our Lord. We are really, really grateful. Now, please bless us, Father, for the next the whole week so that we learn and put into practice all that we learn, Father. Thank you once again, and we ask all this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen.